on today's episode, if you've ever sat in one of my classes, you never hear me say the number one rule is keep your fiber clean. Today, I'm bringing on an expert to talk about this. Don't hang up that phone. We found what you're looking for. Welcome to the Let's Talk Cabling Podcast with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Well, seeing how we're pulling Category 6A, the most powerful twisted pair in the world. You got to ask yourself this one question Did I pull 295 or 300 feet? Well, do you feel lucky? Do you punk? In this podcast, you'll learn the differences between a 66 and 110 punch tool, the proper way to install a support cable, along with testing and certifying the cable. What exactly does RCDD stand for? Registered Communications Distribution Designer. Just the expert you need to ensure your cable plant performs exactly as designed. The elite professional, knowledgeable, and experienced in leading edge ICT design principles. So join us as we talk about the ever-changing world of telecommunications. From ISP to OSP, from copper to fiber, design to installation. Now, send the new guy to the truck for a bucket of dial tone and the cable stretchers while you listen to an informative program on telecommunications. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by our installers, estimators, project managers, IT personnel, and even customers. On this show, we connect at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is being published? If you're listening to us on a podcast platform, such as iTunes, Stitchers, or one of the others, would you mind consider leaving us a rating? Hopefully it's a five-star rating. If it's not, email me. Tell me what I need to do to make this show better. I am on the path to becoming better. Both of those steps, though, help us take on the algorithm so more people can hear this message, so we can educate, encourage, and enrich more lives of people in the ICT industry. Also, don't forget our After Hours Live series where we broadcast live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. I didn't Mm -hmm. broadcast this Thursday because I had an emergency here on the farm and I had to deal with that, so it wasn't one this week, but there will be one next week. On that show, you get to submit your questions to your favorite RCDD. Well, that would be me. Make sure you send your questions to questions at letstalkcabling.com. But I can hear you now. Chuck, I'm driving my truck home. I can't be watching a YouTube video. They're recorded. Go to YouTube. All of them are recorded placed on there. They're also on our webpage. Go to letstalkcabling.com. You find all our vlog articles, all our podcast content, all of our vlogs, even ways to support the channel through Patreon and, and some other methods as well. So make sure you visit that page. The most common issue that most fiber optic technicians run into is contamination. Contamination can cause a lot of problems, but yet it's probably one of the most overlooked, but yet one of the easiest things to take to fix. Rule number one, every fiber is dirty until you clean it. I don't care if you buy a patch cord from a reputable manufacturer and it comes to you in a sealed plastic bag. The first step is to clean it. Along with that, so is every bulkhead. Anything to do with fiber is dirty. So on today's show, we have Brian Teague. Teague is a a Senko's product line manager for their fiber optic connector maintenance products. He has 25 years of fiber optic industry experience as a credentialed certified fiber optic technician, a CFOT from the Fiber Optic Association. He is now one of the fiber optic industry's leading experts on keeping fiber clean. So I think uh, I think he's going to be a good person to interview today. Between his experience helping people cleaning connectors and his clean shaven head, many people know him in the industry as Mr. Clean. Brian also has a Bachelor of Science from the University of South Carolina and his Master's in Business Administration in Florida State University. We're going to have to ask him who he roots for. Right, because I'm living forward to too. He has been a technical presenter in eight countries around the globe, helping people find better ways to manage their fiber optic connectors and their installations. Brian, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hey, Chuck. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you. It's a pleasure to have you. And for those who don't know, Brian and I actually come together and met each other 
through another person whom I interviewed on this show. They, after I get done interviewing Jake, he said, you got to talk to this guy. You and him are two peas in a pod. And then <laughs> when Brian called me, he called me after five o'clock one day. I was actually out on my boat cleaning and getting ready for a thing. And I didn't get anything done. We talked for what, about an hour that night, I think? I think so, yeah. You're, you're my brother from another mother. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm glad to hear that you're as passionate about keeping fiber as clean as I am, because as a quality inspector, that was always one of the most common things, like I said earlier, but also one of the easiest things to, to take care of. Now, I hear all the time people tell us that contamination is a, is a common problem with, it, with installs, with fiber optic cables and assemblies and stuff like that. What are some examples of problems contamination can cause with the connectors and the end faces? Yeah, Chuck, no, that's, that's a great thing. The reason why I, I have the passion um, about working with fiber optic connectors and keeping them clean is because we've seen a lot of what the damage can do. Um, what you were saying in the beginning about uh, with the patch cords that you get in, there's kind of a misperception, especially a lot of people that are kind of new to the industry that, um, hey, when I open up the bag, the, I expect it to be factory clean. And the answer is, you know what? Most of the factories are cleaning it. However, stuff happens, right? And so um, when it comes to, you know, the type of problems you can see, um, it, it, the, the most common one is going to be the insertion loss, right? Um, but also you'll see reflectance issues as well. So if you're doing, let's say, a tier two certification, you're shooting things with the OTDR, it's very apparent. And so when you start looking at the traces on an OTDR, you're going to, you, you know, you always see where the connectors are. But when you start, um, you know, running your trace and, and you have contamination, you're going to see the, the insertion loss go like way up. You're going to see the problems with reflectance. Um, the problem also that, uh, contamination does. Um, I think it's probably one of the primary sources of doing permanent in phase damage, right? And so, um, well, a lot of people don't necessarily think about, they'll say, well, I like to go through and I'll make my connectors together. And if there's an issue, then I'll go back in and, and take a look at it. I'll go back and scope it and try to clean it. The problem when you do that is that the compression force between uh, the two with the two ferrules come together is actually really, really high. So TE Connectivity did a study uh, several years ago where they were looking at the 2.5 for STs and SCs. And what they found was the um, inside of the contact zone in that 200, 250 micron contact zone, they were getting pressures up to over 18,000 PSI. And what they also know is that with the 1.25 ferrules, it actually goes higher, right? Um, so the, the, the problem is if you have a little bit of dust in there, at that pressure level, what's happening is it will start to embed into the glass and into the ferrule material. And once you start having that happen, um, now you're essentially, you're ruining both end faces. And you're going to end up spending a lot more time having to go through and repair that. Um, so whether you're splicing on a pigtail or putting a field install connector on, um, you're going to end up spending a lot more time than if you had been proactive, you know, inspecting it. And, and if, it, if you'd seen the dust, it had been really simple to remove. Um, you know, Chuck, the other thing you said, too, kind of in the opening was about contamination being a major problem. And about, I think the study is about 10 years old, but NTT, AT, which uh, that's the Nippon Telephone Telegraph, they have one of the biggest fiber networks in the world. And it's also, um, it's been around probably a little bit longer than what we've had in the States. The Japanese, sometimes with their technology, sort of lead the way. But when they started taking a look, like, why are we having problems with our fiber optic connectors? They realized that contamination was a big issue. And they ended up doing a study about 10 years ago where they were asking both the network users as well as the installers. And they gave them a list of about uh, 10 different things, you know, from labeling to polarity issues. And what 90% of the installers said was that contamination was something that they had run into on a regular basis. And about 85 or 87% of the network end users were saying the same thing. And so that really 
uh, I think goes to show that, you know, contamination is a problem that's out there. So if you get the new patch cords and you do scope them, which is highly recommended and a great idea to do, and it doesn't take much time, what you're going to see is occasionally you're going to have something on there, whether it's a little bit of dust or even some uh, oil droplets. And my first thing to tell you is it doesn't mean that you have a bad cable assembly supplier or your source is bad. Just sometimes things happen, right? We have uh, dust that will get inside the, the, the dust cap that can sometimes fall in there. Uh, sometimes too, just removing the end cap from the ferrule. You can see uh, times where, um, because it's a, you know, a lot of them are kind of a plastic material that's molded, it, sometimes they just shear and you get a little bit of dust on it. Um, the other thing too, is you may see uh, times where you have like oil droplets and uh, in some of these plastic materials that are really robust, they are actually uh, outgassing, right? So everything can be perfect. So when it's going through the factory, the guy's testing it, he's documenting it down, he's writing down what the insertion loss reflected is, he's telling you the truth. Um, just sometimes things happen. Um, the other thing too is if you're doing any kind of testing, like if you're doing uh, link certification testing, um, another area that people sometimes forget about is those, those reference cables that they're using, right? So if you're going through, you're mating it up, you're testing your insertion loss on your OL, OL, the OLTS set, um, you're mating, right? And so you're, anytime you have these moving parts, you have contact friction. And so it's that contact friction that's generating the wear debris. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a, you know, Chuck, it's one of these things where, you know, just a hey, dust is gonna happen. Once in a while, things will bump my finger, might get some oil residue or, you know, humidity, whatever. Um, it's common and it's gonna happen. Um, when I tell guys, you know, hey, you, you need to make sure you're proactive inspection and cleaning. Um, a lot of will tell you, so, well, you know, I don't have time for that. I don't, I, I, you know, or that's a, you know, it's, it's expensive. I don't know if I'm going to do that. And what I would tell you is, you know, if you think about the cost of failure, um, it's going to cost you a lot more. And so like um, what you're doing is kind of sort of the same way of like speeding on the highway, right? You can go through, I can, I can take my truck and I go tearing down the highway and I'll probably get a, but the day that I go shooting by one of these uh, state troopers, or one of the state, these police guys with a radar gun, and he gets me, that's going to be a real painful day. And it's sort of the same way with your fiber connectors, right? You can go in, you can plug it up, you're going to get away with it a lot of times. But the question I'd ask is, is it worth the risk? And, you know, if you do have to get in, you do have to start replacing. It's going to be expensive, right? Just like when I got my ticket. Um, and if you think about it, if you don't have time, I think it was John Wooden, the, 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 the basketball coach at UCLA, he used to tell his players, you know, if you don't have time to do it right, are you going to have time to, you know, when are you going to have time to correct it? When are you going to have time to do it correctly? So um, I would say, you know, the key is to, to, you know, think sort of like that. It works in sports, works in life, works with fiber optics. Yeah, you, you, I could go seven different ways with that, the answer to that question. Um, but the one I'm going to pick is the cost of quality, right? So let's say, you know, it, you, it, it, you had estimated two hours to terminate and get that fiber up and running and you didn't bother checking it and you'd leave it and you're off and running and you didn't clean it. There was a dirty patch cord or whatever. And now the customer's calling you up and you have to go back to fix that. Well, what's the true cost there, right? Well, you gotta pay the technician to go to that job site to work for another hour, two hours, three hours, not making any revenue because they're on a service call, right? Number two, they're losing revenue where that technician should be working to making revenue for the company. And number three, how do you calculate, maybe you might know the answer to this, because I sure don't, how do you calculate the loss of confidence within the customer? Yeah, right. you're, you're, you're right. There's that lost opportunity cost. And see, and those are the things where um, it's happening all the time. It's happening all the time. And, and you, you know, when they start thinking about, hey, I've got to do a fiber installation. It's going to take me several hours to, you know, pull these cables and get it in. When you start looking at some of the equipment that's out there now, um, it's, very, it's very fast and it's really easy to use. So you're not really adding that much time to it. If you think about it, um, the amount of time to go through, let's say if it took me, let's say two seconds to look at, a, at an end phase. 
and, and I was going to do a 100% inspection of 144 fibers. So I'm going to do 288 on one end and 288 on the other, right? If you go through, you're going to go, man, that is a lot of time. But if you think about it, if it only takes two seconds and you go through and you start doing the calculations, I think it comes out to less than 30 minutes. Right. So if it took me six hours to pull the cable, I'm saying, hey, why don't you take a little bit more time, maybe an extra half hour just to check it? You know, Chuck, the other thing that I see uh, guys doing is, uh, to try to save time is they'll just want to go through and they use these click cleaners, right? Just click, click, click. And um, they'll say, well, we go through and we clean everything. Well, Let's think about that for a second as well, right? So a couple things. The first one is, what if those connector phases weren't dirty? So you're not going to see contamination every time on every end phase. Remember before I was saying it's kind of like speeding down the interstate. I can plug these things in. A lot of times I'll be okay. The day that I plug something in and it's not working right, that's when it becomes painful. But if I'm going through and let's say maybe 90% of the end phases were fine, but I'm out there clicking my clicker, um, you know, two or three times per end phase on everything, that's a lot of money. So if it was uh, something that every time I push that tool, it's 10 cents and it starts to add up. Right. And so if you start doing a few projects like that, well, if you kind of start to do the math, you could have more than paid for like a nice digital microscope. Right. And those are the type of products too you're going to need if you have to do any kind of like, you know, tier certification of the links and the end base and you have to, you know, check the polarity and the length. And, and so if you're just going out and just clicking and thinking, hey, this is great, I'd warn you, hey, you might be ended up wasting a lot of money. The other thing too is there's a wide range on these tools. So I'll pick one of the kind of the common brands is the one click. And it's a, it's a really good tool. It's, it's made by Fujikara and there's others that are out there. Uh, Senko has their smart cleaner and Feral Mates by Psycho Geek and so forth. Um, those tools are really good. But then there's also, we're seeing a wave of these kind of knockoff tools coming from uh, China, from these uh, suppliers to say that their quality isn't quite up to standard. So if you're getting some of these little um, knockoff type tools off the internet or wherever, and you start banging away on your end faces two or three times, you may actually end up causing more problems they don't perform all the same. So even sometimes they may, you, look, you hold them side by side, they look pretty close, but the performance is a lot different. So again, you know, if you think, hey, I just wanna go out and just click and clean everything, um, you're, you're taking some chances there. Good intention. And maybe it, it, you're, you're trying to do the right thing, which I think is admirable, but you could end up doing more harm than good. So you may end up, um, potentially causing contamination because if you're doing this inside like in a data center or central office where um, the humidity level is a lot lower than it is like in an outside plant setting you can end up putting a trivia electric charge or basically mm -hmm. a static charge on those end faces and so as you're out there banging away clicking on it there's a lot of material running across that end face. And, you know, if you think about a fiber optic connector, it's glass and ceramic. It's, it's essentially acting like an electrical insulator. So once that charge gets on, it, it ain't going anywhere. So any oppositely charged particles that are close. And we talked about like the wear debris from plugging connectors in. So if I have a negative charge on my end face from clicking it two or three times, uh, if I have positively charged dust particles that are kind of in the uh, adapter port um, or, you know, even around in the air, they're going to get pulled onto that end face because, you know, everything wants to go back to electrical, basically neutral if it can. So, and then once it's on there, it doesn't fall off. A, a good illustration of this is think about a ceiling fan, right? So if you look at your ceiling fan, I guarantee you pretty much unless you're, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're somebody like my wife, where she's meticulously cleaning these things all the time, I guarantee you got dust on the blades. And where does the dust on the blade accumulate? It's right usually the on the lead, right? And it's the side that which, whichever direction your fan's going, that's, that's where the, the dust. And does the dust fall off when you turn the fan off? Nope. It stays on there, right? And so if you were to look at a lot of office fans or whatever, you'll see, you know, the dust accumulating on there. And it's kind of the same way. That's uh, the fan example is kind of an extreme. But essentially, that's the same principle that's happening. And so that's where, uh, again, kind of that blind cleaning, um, I, you know, I understand why they do it. 
but it's also, you know, again, it kind of goes back to the importance of, of, of understanding why you're doing what you're doing um, and understanding, hey, you know, just, just thinking it through, just thinking it through. And, and you know, inspection and cleaning is, is definitely the way to go, but a lot of people forget about this, you know, the importance of this inspection component. So, so let me ask you this. You, you called it a dust cap. I, I, I picked up on that. I, I was always trained to call it a protective cap. Because a dust cap, yeah. When you look inside with a microscope, you're really going to find dust, right? Yeah. So really, I've always been told it was a protective cap. Now, so you listed, you know, all the different types of contamination where it can come from and stuff like that. Let me ask you this: What's a good way for someone to help avoid that, or to help eliminate that contamination from even happening? Well, you know. Chuck, the best, the best, the best thing I can tell you, or the best counsel I can try to give people, is you know, first get an inspection scope, take a look at it. Um, you, by inspecting it, what you're going to do is you'll see if there's something there, and then once you start seeing what's there, um, a lot of times you're going to start to see a pattern, right? So if you're noticing, it's like, man, every time I'm looking at a lot of these in faces, I'm noticing what's that little dark, oily looking things. You know what? Maybe what's happening is somebody's bumping it with their finger, or maybe the, I don't know, the, the old, I'm going to rub it on my shirt cleaning method. And then you can kind of start trying to figure out where's the contamination coming from. And then once you kind of start sort of drilling into it, then you can kind of go, dude, what are you doing, man? Stop ripen the connector on your shirt that's crazy you know so you can kind of try to put put some of that in, in, in the place um, by you know training your team or whatever um but the other thing too is like when you are inspecting it and you, you are kind of catching it and again it, it, it's going to happen right um but then making sure you have good tools right and and if you're going to use things like there's a lot of wonderful products out there. We have like wipes and sticks and, you know, we have the Klee Top cassette, which has been around for over 30 something years, literally. But the thing is, um, I can give you the best cassette, the best sticks, the best cleaning fluid. But if you don't know how to really use it very well, you're not going to have a very effective cleaning process, right? And Chuck, you probably a lot of guys kind of rolling their eyes right now. Like, dude, I know how to, I need to wipe the connector. I'm sure you do, but I mean, you'll see things like guys doing the figure eight. And the problem with the figure eight is it was originally done for the hand polishing, right? But what's happening is, as I'm doing that figure eight, if I took off, let's say, a residue and I run that end face back through it again, mm -hmm. I'm going to probably reapply the contaminant. A good example or analogy is like, I'm sure most people have mopped the floor. Right. So when you mop the floor, you have to be kind of careful. You know, you kind of mop. And if I just go just, you know, crazy mopping the floor, I, I may end up leaving a bunch of streaks over there. Right. And so it's kind of the same thing. So you can go out and buy the best products that are out there, best quality products. But again, you want to sit there and make sure your team knows how to use it correctly. One of the things that I do with some of our new engineers over at Senko when I'm working with them and kind of we talk about this or even some of our salespeople. I tell them, hey, go, you know, go, 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 go get some of these things and just play with it. And so the good thing about the scope, and it's really comes down to good technique, right? Mm -hmm. So I can give you great products, but the best thing you can do is just kind of practice a little bit with it. Hands on experience. Yeah. And, 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 and the more, the more you kind of play with it and the more comfortable you'll get with it, the better your technique and, 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 and your effectiveness will become much better. So uh, it's and it's like anything else. I mean, you can always talk to the vendor. Hey, send me over some test reports, and most of us have those kind of things. But then, you know, it's kind of like playing cards. I trust you, but hey, we're going to cut the deck anyway, huh? And so it's that you know when you get these things in, you know, just just give them a try. Make sure it's working for you. Um, you one know, of the things that we battle quite often, uh, Brian. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. One of the things that we, okay. we battle quite often is, you know, we get people say, "Well, that's the way that I was trained." And well, you know, my dad always used to say, just because that's the way you always did it doesn't mean that's the way you should do it now. Because, <laughs> you know, products change, things change, and you always got to look at the latest take. You mentioned the perfect example, you know, the figure eights. That was used for, you know, polished connectors, two part epoxy fiber optic connectors. And that's not the way you want to clean a fiber optic connector at all, right? Now, you, right. you mentioned about um, doing end face inspections and stuff, and you talk about fiber optic scopes and stuff. If you were to buy, if somebody's out there getting ready to buy a scope, what do you think would be some important features that they should be looking for? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think a lot of it, um, 
there, there's a wide range of products that are out there, right? And so when they start thinking about scopes, um, I think you need to think uh, about several things. The first one is where am I working at? Right, so um, there's you know benchtop scopes and wireless scopes. Um, if you're, especially if you're, um, if you have a construction company or a network installer, okay. Well, one of the things you may say, well, we always want a wireless scope. We can, we can that way we can always kind of have these things coming in their phone. But what happens if you get a job working for one of the hyperscales on a military base, right? So you might need to kind of think about it. It's like, do I need something that doesn't have a radio or I can turn the radio off, right? So these are kind of little, little niche things, you know, you may not be doing it today, but in the future, you know, down the road, do I want to try to do a project for the Navy? Do I want to try to do, you know, is that, is that something that you should think about? The other one too, is think about the connector systems you're working with. Now, most of the inspection tips that you see out there um, with most of those scopes that are out there, they're pretty straightforward. However, when you start getting into some of the things like LCAPCs, they always get a little bit tricky, right? Because um, you want to think about, you know, am I working with fiber management panels that are pretty dense? Do I need like a longer reach tip or whatever? And then how much is that going to cost, right? So if I look at a scope and I go, hey, wow, you know, the scope is, you know, 1500 bucks and I'm looking at a, you know, $1,200 tip. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I mean, there is no one that's the best. It, it just kind of varies. The, the one thing I would highly recommend that most people do, especially now, is stay away from the analog scopes. Um, the digital scopes are really good because they can do several things. Even if you don't necessarily need to do the full IEC inspection, um, but if you ever did need to get in there and take measurements of it, Remember, when you scope things, you're not just looking for contamination, but you're, you're, you're checking the end phase quality. And sometimes the difference between passing and failing, meaning that, you know, if there's a surface defect like a scratch, could be the difference between three microns and four microns. I can't visually look at and tell that, you know, with the analog scope. So the digital scope gives me that, plus it gives me that repeatability. If I own my own uh, construction company or had a network installation company, the other good thing is now I can document the work. So, you, you know, um, you know, Chuck, I know you're an RCDD, right? When you, when, when, you know, when you hire guys who are RCDDs, you, the, the quality level expectation is, 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 hey, these are well-trained, these are quality oriented. You know what, when you have those copes that can give you that good report and you can show it, that's what, that's what a customer or network uh, owner is gonna expect. But even if you're doing a smaller project where somebody's not, necessarily doing um ha has that written into the scope of work you know what you can save it and you can just you know you can have your, your pdf files out there so that way when you get a call two weeks later going hey my my network's on problems and you come out and take a look at it and go look when i left this is what inface looked like somebody came out here and they changed stuff uh, yep. but at least you can kind of you, you know you have something here to document the quality of the work so um the good thing about those scopes now with the digital um inspection scopes is you know, they remove the human subjectivity. Mm -hmm. They give you repeatability yep. in the measurement and the accuracy. So to me, you know, that would be the big thing is make sure you get a scope that's got some kind of, uh, you know, uh, measurement uh, with the with the uh, software in it. And, and those things are so easy to use now. They're yeah. so easy to use. So. Yeah, I just actually made a TikTok video just a, the other day because uh, we right. have a TikTok channel for Let's Talk Cabling. Oh. And, and I said the three most important things that you can have on any project are documentation, documentation, and documentation. Exactly. And you, and you hit the nail right on the head. There's been more than one time where, you know, I've run crews or project managed crews and they've left the project perfectly clean and safe. And, and then next thing you know, two, three weeks, a month, two months later, we're getting a call because the fiber is not working or whatever. And, and you go out there and sure enough, they, they had cross contaminated an end face because they used a fiber patch cord that's been sitting on top of the server for, for two months. And, and now they're wanting it to be done under service call. And no, nah, no, nah, hold on, stop. <laughs> we didn't leave it this way. So we got to actually fix that. So I was glad that you pointed out because that's, that's a huge, huge one there, right? Um, so let me ask you another question. So there's a lot of uh, products on the market for cleaning fiber and end phases and stuff like that. In your opinion, which do you think is really the best? Well, you know, it kind of goes back to thinking about your situation, right? So I know a lot of people like the clickers. And, and the good thing about the, the click cleaners 
is that you're able to clean both end bases very quickly and those tools are self-aligning. But as I was saying before, you know, the quality kind of varies from supplier to supplier. That's why some you're punching it two or three times and others you can punch it one time and it's getting it. Um, those are good if you're doing, let's say, high fiber counts and you're dealing with, let's say, light to maybe moderate levels of contamination. If I were working in, let's say, kind of a campus environment where I'm having to deal with stuff outdoors or I'm going, you know, work for my local carrier and I'm doing, you know, I have to go out to the pedestals where the last guy he may or may not have sealed it back right. You know, there I would probably have, you know, uh, like some good quality sticks and swabs, cleaning solvents, wipes, uh, cassette. Um, so there, there's, you know, those options are all good, but again, they're only as good as, as, as the operator's technique. But when you start looking at, um, especially if you're gonna use solvents, um, the, the wet to dry process is, is uh, something that is really good. It can be very helpful. Um, it eliminate those static charge problems that I was talking about earlier. Um, the, basically the introduction of the fluid is uh, creating that dissipative medium. So it's pulling the charge off, right? That said, not all the fluids are the same, right? So you have some that, for example, are kind of, you'll call it, let's say, aqueous-based or water-based. Um, and some of them are pretty good for cleaning, but if you are, let's say, in the Northeast or in the Upper Plains and you leave that thing in the truck overnight, it's gonna be frozen, right? Uh, other things when you start dealing with chemicals, and I would even throw dusters into this as well, or canned air is that you need to also make sure you understand kind of the chemical regulations that are out there. So for example, um, if you're going into places like Orange County, California has even more strict restrictions than the state of California or the rest of the states. And you're seeing, um, you're, you're seeing a lot of places now kind of look at how they look at chemistry. So it, that's important to make sure you understand you know, the proper storage and where you're going. Um, having the safety data sheets. Um, if you're looking at things like Kim Wipe, the paper kit is good, especially like in a production environment and even maybe in the splicing trailer. But if you're um, kind of in an area where, you know, it's going to be raining or whatever, you know, a, 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 a cross contaminant wipe ain't going to do you no good, right? Um, so maybe something like that, a cassette would do well. Um, other times, you know, if you're just uh, looking at light sticks and cassettes, I mean, th those again, are really good, but there's a lot of different um, options that are out there. So, you know, Chuck, it really just boils down to think about your situation, meaning what kind of connectors am I dealing with, right? You want to make sure I have the appropriate tools. So if I have everything for 2.5 and 2.5 base connectors and I start dealing with MPOs, you know, I'm stuck, right? Um, the other thing, too, is think about the type of contamination that these connectors have been potentially exposed to. If I'm doing something in a data center, it's probably light level, some contamination, we would hope. Um, and so, you know, some of the click cleaners will probably be fine. But you know what? Maybe just in the bag, tool bag, just in case you might want to have some backup stuff in there. Should I do a dry cleaning or wet to dry cleaning? I would say if you're dealing with primarily uh, invases that are dealing with light levels of contamination with a good quality product, you're fine clicking it or wiping it on that cassette. But, you know, does it make sense to have uh, some kind of a fluid or even in alcohol? Sure. You know, because there may be times where you run into something a little bit tough. Um, the one thing I will say about alcohol is that, um, and I've, I've seen this a few times myself, is um, alcohol by nature is hydroscopic, meaning it attracts the moisture from the air. And so uh, kind of a common thing I've seen in mainly kind of more splice trailers on the production lines is that the guys just keep, you know, to keep dumping alcohol into the reservoir. Or sometimes too, it's like, well, I couldn't get the 99% the grade. So I got the stuff, you know, there's a Walgreens down the road. So I put that in. Okay, well, the problem is now you're potentially introducing impurities, right? So if you're going to use alcohol, which I know a lot of people use, and, they, and, it, and it's it, you know if 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 worked well with and, and, and contained you know into a you know good container, uh, it'll it'll be you'll be fine. But um, but there's a lot of variants out there. So if you're using alcohol, just make sure you're kind of using the right grade, making sure that you put it in a container that's sealed um, properly, and then you know periodically change it out. Right? Alcohol is not very expensive, so you know when when, when you do that. Just also maybe take one of your wipes and just kind of just can get into the reservoir, wipe it out, just make sure it's not any, you know, crud or whatever that's in there from the last job. Yeah, but, you picked uh, up on two of the things that I always tell technicians all the time about alcohol. 
always buy the 99% gray. Don't buy the other stuff. Yes. And, and always be careful. Don't just leave the bottle open because especially here in Florida, we have humidity, right? Yeah. Just like you have humidity where you live. Um, mm -hmm. Out in Arizona, you may not have humidity, but you'll get evaporation. Um, and it, it, it just it just makes that, that contamination concentration exactly. even go up even more, which cause you all kinds of problems, right? So let me get, I got another question for you, right? So we all know, especially in our industry, what is time? It's money, right? You yes. Know, anytime, anytime it takes money, time to do something, there's a cost associated with that, right? And you talked earlier about making sure that your end faces are clean and stuff, right? Have you guys tried to quantify, uh, put, put, put a dollar value on, on what savings it would be to keep it clean or verify that it's clean as opposed to come back later? on a service call kind of environment? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's some things you can kind of think about. And, I, and, I've, and I've actually have uh, included this in some of like some of the past training programs. But um, Chuck, one of the things also actually bring up a great point is, OK, so if you start thinking about what is the cost of a truck rollback? Right. So every time I send a, or every time I send a truck out from the garage, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. Right. Okay, so let's let's just kind of use a number that I think is kind of common out there in the United States. It's anywhere from about 150 to 200 dollars just to send the truck out, right? If you look at what there's a few guys like CenturyLink and there's some some of the MSO guys that put stuff out there to try to explain, you know, the their costs for when they do a service call. So that's your first thing. Then the other one is the time spent troubleshooting. Um, a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this myself is you're not necessarily thinking about the dirty connector. It's got to be something else. Maybe it's, is it a bad transceiver? Is it, you know, is it this or that? Sometimes the obvious problem is right in front of us, right? But how much time am I going to spend out there, you know, labor hours on that? So let's say I spend a couple hours, um, you, know, you know, sending the truck out and I've got to pay the technician to do that. Um, so, you know, it starts to add up. Now let's say I get out there and because we realized, you know, it was uh, contaminated and I try to clean it and I'm not getting it quite clean or um, I'll say this sometimes you'll hear you know Brian the cleaner that we have here doesn't work and one of the things you can tell if you have embedded dust is if you and again this is why you want to have a scope if you look at it and you've wiped it a time or two and the dust isn't going in anywhere well it's because it's stuck in the ferrule or the glass. And so it, there is no cleaner that's going to do it. So you're going to have to replace it, right? So now you start getting into replacement costs. Now, you know, hopefully if that's the case, maybe I have a field install connector or something in the truck, but that's going to take more time, right? I'm going to have to prep it and put it on. Or um, I may not have one with me. So now all of a sudden I'll have to tell the customer, hey, dude, I'm sorry, I'll, I've got to go down to the local distributor and get one. Hopefully the local distributor is open. And then I'm going to have to come back, right? So all of a sudden, it's just like, it just keeps adding up, adding up, adding up. And it's going to vary from place to place. So for example, if that happens in Manhattan, it's going to be a heck of a lot more expensive than if it happens in my neck of the woods in Columbia, South Carolina, right? But still, nonetheless, it's expensive. And, but you know what? And it, it doesn't even matter, right? Because it can also happen even in places like I was working with some uh, uh, data center installation companies over in Mumbai. Right, they'll tell you, hey, the labor cost over here is really cheap. I hear you, but you know what? It's still a per the, the percentage of what labor is on a project is still fairly consistent. So it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, your labor cost might be lower, but it's still impacting your bottom line. So again, this kind of really goes back into the importance of making sure you do the job right the first time. And that's, you know, Chuck, this is one of the things I love about what you're doing is you're helping people understand so they can think you know, basically good situational awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's that training, right? And making sure the people know how to do it. Um, and then the other one too, is also making sure they have good quality products. So in the case where I would say, you know, if you're going to do a lot of fiber installations, have that inspection scope, have some good cleaning options available to them, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, teach them, help them understand why they're doing this. Because I think some people kind of like, ah, you know, cleaning's not real sexy, but you know what? It's like brushing your teeth. Yeah, you know, if you don't do it, your teeth are going to rot out. And you can, you can yep. have an ugly smile, right? So it's kind of the same thing too. Brushing my teeth isn't real sexy, 
But you know what? If I don't do it for a day or so. I bet your wife won't let you kiss her. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> and there's going to be no loving for Brian at the house, right? So, yep. <laughs> and my kids yep. will be dogging me. So, you know, it's like everything else. I mean, sometimes it's just basics. But uh, the best thing you can do is, you know, just start thinking about these kind of things. And you know what? It's not something that people are going to get real excited about, but what you're doing is you're avoiding a lot of headaches. Mm -hmm. And most of us are kind of stressed for time. Most of us are stressed. But anyway, right, it's, it's, we live in a crazy world right now. Anything that we could do to make some of the yep. world a little bit less crazy and a little bit easier to deal with, that's a good thing. And, and this is so simple, right? Just yep. looking at the connector. Is it dirty? Okay. Clean it. Okay, do. We're done. You know, and you don't have to worry about some of those things. So um chuck it's sometimes hard to quantify say it's worth x amount of dollars but when you start looking at it and then you know like you're saying before also the opportunity cost right right um, there's the intangibles it, that you can't calculate yes. i mentioned one of them loss of customer confidence but you know right after i said that and you start talking i thought of another one right off the top of my head what about the, what about your reputation with your peers and stuff yeah that's, that's another one you can't quantify right so let's let's shift the conversation right now senko they're known for for you know, manufacturing and providing good quality fiber optic connectors and stuff like that. What are some of the trends that you guys are seeing with fiber optic connector designs? Yeah, so it, yeah, thank you for asking about that. I mean, yeah, one of the things that we're seeing again, and you're seeing across the board, is reduction in density. And so what everybody's trying to do is figure out, hey, how can I get, basically aggregate more fibers into that smaller footprint? And just coming off of the Bixie show, one of the big topics is, um, you know, like 400 gig, 800 gig and beyond. And so right now we may be going, you know, wow, that's, uh, that, that seems like, you know, 10 years from now for my network. We know it, it may not be that far off, right? If you look at the cost of the components are coming down. And so uh, this may be hitting your network sooner than you realize, which is a good thing, right? You're going to have a better, better network and uh, things are kind of cool. But what you're seeing is the packaging of the barrels getting smaller and smaller. So there's always been the NPOs, which have like the ball fiber arrays in it, but fibers. But the other trend that we're starting to see is 16 fibers. So they're a little bit different. The difference between a 12 and a 16 is they have an orientation key. So the orientation key for the 12 fiber arrays is in the center, 16 are offset. They do that to prevent people from accidentally, you know, plugging the 16 fiber or 32 fiber into the 12. Or, or that makes or, sense, or, makes perfect or. sense. And, and then you're also seeing with these QSFP DD uh, uh, connectors, like the, for example, there's a SN connector and the CS connector. They have these little same 1.25 ferrules, but they're, they're a duplex and they're less than 50% of the size of an LC duplex. Um, and so, again, it's about reducing the density so I can put more fiber into that one RU footprint. And the other driver for that, in addition to that, is people are also trying to manage their uh, cooling cost. It, you know, and so what you're doing by going with these smaller connectors, you're able to use smaller cables. And by doing that, I think it also improves the airflow. So there's a number of different things that are out there. So, so everybody wants higher data rates. Everybody wants the, uh, the, the, the cost to come down. So like if I end up crushing, you know, one of the channels on an MPO, I'm stuck, right? So with these little duplex connectors, very easy to come in and swap them out. Uh, and then of course, the other thing too, is anything, you know, even if something small, like a connector can kind of help improve the airflow inside the rack, that's a good thing, right? And so that's gonna help me if I'm a, you know, if I'm a facilities manager, if I can kind of do anything that's going to improve the airflow so, so that I can keep the heat aisles uh, less hot, that's, that's a major plus. So, so airflow seeing... is probably a, a driving factor on that, right? So, and so probably footprint because it costs money to build data centers, right? Are there any other factors driving these, these new connector designs besides airflow and, and sizing? Yeah, we're also seeing it. Um, so even for like standard connectors, um, you're seeing also people just saying, hey, how can we make the boots um, smaller? And so if you think about it, it's these are things kind of behind the wall, right? So what you're if you look, if you're working with like cassettes or even with some of the like some of the routers and servers, um, anything that I could do to uh, reduce the congestion inside behind the wall is a good thing. So what you're seeing now, um, most of this is not going to be 
you know, if you look at like an, an MPO, we have like, you know, many micro MPOs and, you know, micro latches and stuff like that, that keep the, the ferrule and the connector very stable inside the adapter port. So if I were looking at one of these cassettes, I would never notice it from the outside, but on the inside, um, it makes it a lot easier. And so the reason that's important, or if I'm a, you know, again, a network designer, why would I care about that stuff? I mean, that's my cable assembly guy's problem, right? What now he's able to do is actually reduce the density. And, and so he can build smaller cassettes, right? And so now again, you can start putting more, more, um, you know, more fiber into that, to that one RD footprint and save real estate. But the other thing too, is also it's allowing them from a routing standpoint to, to improve how they route it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's making things a lot better from a manufacturing standpoint. And so that improves their yield. Uh, better yields mean that I have more control of my costs. Better control of my costs mean that I can be more competitive uh, on my right. pricing. So when you have a larger project, and I think there's several things like that that are, again, helping drive down the cost of fiber to make it more attractive. Yeah, cost is is is, is key. I, I, I used to be an estimator once upon a time, one of the positions I've held in this career. And, and I once lost a $500,000 project by literally hundreds of dollars. So if I could have gone back and just tweaked one thing, if I'd have known that, I, I would mm -hmm. have, right? Uh, another question I get quite often, I get, I get, you know, because I find that there's a lot of hungry people for knowledge in, 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 in the ICT industry, right? What advice would you give somebody who's new to the fiber optic industry that's going to help them become successful? Yeah, so the you, you know, and I it, it, Chuck, it's kind of a, we're living in an exciting time, right? Because we're we're seeing fiber going into a whole lot more applications. Uh, it's becoming even you know it's becoming even more common than it was say like five to ten years ago, and so the best thing that I think you could do to try to help your career is make the investment in training, um, and that would even say also if you own a company and you're bringing in new technicians, make the investment in training. Now, one of the things I'll hear sometimes is, well, I don't know if I really want to spend a lot of money training these guys because then if I train them, they'll leave me. Well, let's think about it for a second, right? One of the things that causes people to leave an employer, it's a lot of times they don't feel valued or right. it's, you know, sometimes it's a money thing. But when you start investing into your employees, there's a few things happen when you tell them, hey, you are the most important part of my company. You know what? You're now walking the walk. They see that, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to help build that loyalty. And I think that's going to help with actually customer retention. I don't think most people are going to come in and get trained and, and, and scoot on you unless you're, you know, just a horrible boss, which I think, you know, Chuck, everybody on this show is going to be a great boss, right? Right. So that's not going to be a problem. But the other thing too is also you're helping these folks understand how to do the job right, correctly. That's going to impact your bottom line, right? So if they understand and they have the training, that means less reworks. That means less frustrated customers. That means also you're able to do the job maybe a little bit faster and you're going to be able to take on more projects. So the best thing you can do, whether it's yourself or if you're, if you're an employer, is, is invest in the training. Um, these are things that are going to help you basically build your business and also help you establish yourself as a good quality company that's out there. So training, 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 training. Yeah, there was a quote, and I and I, I'm probably going to have to paraphrase it because I can't remember it exactly, and I can't even I can't even remember who uh, who was uh, quoted or who said said it, but it said, you know, we can't afford to train our employees. We can't afford the cost. And what what about if you? What's the cost if you don't train them? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember who said that, but I, I do remember reading it one time because I'm always reading something somewhere, some shape, form, or another. You, so you, we're you know, running out of time. Somebody. I was going to say, there's always somebody that's going to be out there cheaper than you. You know oh, what? Yeah. Who cares? One of the best things I could tell you, and this is kind of the NBA me coming out, think about Levi's jeans. I think they were started in 1867 or something like that. The back of every Levi's jeans, it said, you know, uh, it, it was a statement about quality. You know what? And that is true. And it doesn't matter where you go in this world, that people want to wear Levi's jeans. And they've been wearing Levi's jeans since the 1800s. Yeah. So they've survived multiple world wars. And it's because quality matters. That's what it is on, on every thing. Quality matters. And so, you know what? You want to be that person. And, and, and kind of a quick, if I could leave you a quick analogy, if I offered you two cars, Chuck, you can have the, the little Fiat or you can have the Ferrari. Which one are you going to pick? You're going to take the Ferrari, neither, right? Neither one of them is going to help me on a farm. 
Well, <laughs> the wife might like to, to ride around on Ferrari, but the, but what I'm saying I got a is three-acre homestead. If I try to put three thousand pounds of manure in the back of either one of those, I'm not going very far. <laughs> yeah, well, good point, good point. But uh, yeah, but you, anyway, you could, anyway, you could have said an F three fifty because an F three fifty is not cheap either. So yes, that's right. So, yeah. so there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I quality is king over everything. Absolutely. That's why, uh, and I used to work for a company that they would tell people right out of the gate, we're not the cheapest, but we're the best, you know? Yep. Yeah, it's just depending what you, you find with the pain point. And you're going to have some customers that that's their pain point. They don't care. They want the cheapest and they don't care if they get the best quality or not. And that's just that you don't want that customer because that customer is going to nickel and dime you over exactly. all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, hey, I, this conversation went a little longer than I expected, but we're going to have to have you back on again because you and I, I, we can talk about a lot of stuff. And my puppy keeps coming over. Dad, give me attention. Yeah, yeah I, I, I see the dog in the back. That's yeah, cool. Keeps, <laughs> that, that's the show dog right there. She's uh, right. she's Harley the cable dog, and she's demanding attention. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate you coming on, and uh, let's 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 have you on again soon. Hey, Chuck, I appreciate it. Thanks for your time, and I appreciate everybody watching. And uh, yeah, thanks again for the. Uh, it's, it was a privilege to be on here, and it's great to to have this conversation with you today. So thank you. Well, thank you, Brian. Until next time, everybody, be safe.